All right, to welcome you to this edition of EMU Today TV. My name is Mark S. Lee, and I'm your host for this, uh, now our sixth season, and we enjoy doing this each and every single month. And I'm so pleased to welcome back to EMU Today TV, Dr. Doris Fields, the Interim Chief Diversity Officer. And we're gonna have a very thoughtful conversation for the next few minutes. A lot of things have been happening, so we're going to jump right into it. Dr. Fos, thank you for joining me. How are you doing? I'm good, Mark. How are you? Thank I'm you for well, having thank me. You. Absolutely. It's always good to have you back. You know, uh, you've been on several times over the last uh, several months, and let's just jump right into this conversation. It's very important that we get right into it. Uh, certainly what's happened top of mind with a lot of people is Memphis. So what happened in Memphis, Tennessee with Tyree Nichols, uh, you and the president put out a joint statement recently. Let me give you a chance to address, from your perspective, the university's perspective, uh, the situation in Memphis and what the university is currently doing. So uh, when we first heard of uh, the incident, it was just very sad. Um, and then the announcement of the video being released, uh, for me, it was personal because I've had certain things happen in my family with my, my uh, young nephews. And so uh, it did not go to that extent what happened to Tyree Nichols, but I took it personally. And I think at the university, we wanted to provide a safe space that we know that these events can be racially triggering for students. Uh, police violence is an issue that they wanna talk about. They also want to talk about their sadness and disappointment that we're still here. It doesn't feel as if progress has been made, even though there has been increment progress. It's just that I don't think that people have felt that. And so we wanted to make sure we did our due diligence and made sure that we supported students because students are the center of, of the university. And so it was just personal and it was also important to give uh, students, stack, faculty and staff the opportunity to talk and feel comfortable doing that, during a difficult situation. Yeah, so my understanding, so you recently you just started these safe place conversations, expound on that briefly in terms of uh, how many are, are being held and, and uh, just talk a little bit more about that if you could. So right now we're going to currently hold two sessions. Uh, we're gonna do them on a Monday and a Wednesday. Uh, on a Monday, we're gonna provide time on from two to four. And on Wednesday, we're gonna provide time from three to five. We have uh, several uh, campus experts because I am not an expert in mental health. And it was important to have people there that could support the students. We had Aaron Smith, who is a psychologist with CAPS. We have Aaron Schaefer, who is a social worker with CAPS. We also have uh, one of my great colleagues, uh, Lachey Webb, who's a mental health specialist. And we had DeAndre Cotwell, who's also a social worker and a caseworker for the university. I thought it was important to put people who do this work in front. I didn't, I wanted to create the space, but I wanted to have experts come in and deal with some of the emotions uh, and some of the conversations that the students will have. And we also had, well, which was very wonderful to have his support, uh, Chief Matt Lige, a uh, police officer. That's yes. outstanding. And so, yeah, I think this is very important to uh, have this conversation. We know that there's been a lot of discussion and there's certainly a lot of the debate going back and forth. So I applaud the university for for doing this. I applaud you for doing this. And, and as we look back, let's look back to Black, uh, I'm sorry, the MLK days you had recently at the university. Uh, had the opportunity of attending the lunch and phenomenal Thanks. sold out over 400 people attended you were one of the co-chairs let's give yeah. you an opportunity to talk about that the success of this year's mlk days held at one campus I, I would be remiss if i did not acknowledge my other co-chair uh who i could not have done and the fabulous mlk planning committee yeah. so i have to applaud trey mcguire uh, tremendous help and planning. I think we we planned for about seven, eight months uh, with the speaker that was is getting the speaker, uh, Dr. Sampson Davis. We were so excited uh, to discover his book, The Pack. So what we did is a three-part listening series on his book. Uh, very, very well attended. Uh, he talked about his experiences, his challenging upbringing, 
and getting to the point in high school where they all kind of made a decision of, of this is what we want our life to be. It doesn't have to be what we're living. And I think that's per, per, uh, profound given the fact that he, where he grew up in to say, I'm not going to accept this type of life for myself. And they changed around and they became a supporting force, which to me is the heart of the story. That as a college student, you need a supportive force, whether it's uh, your parents, faculty, staff, amazing teacher, but somebody to push you. And they had what I call the perfect storm of people pushing them. And they were able to not only become doctors, two medical doctors and one dentist, but to start a foundation, to give back. He has been all over Oprah, CNN, View. He was just an outstanding speaker. The whole weekend was absolutely wonderful. Um, Friday, we started with the kickoff and we had the forensics team, very talented, give pieces that made individuals in the audience just cry. They were beautiful. Uh, I'm on the process of trying to get those uh, off my phone and then to record it so the other people can see it. <laughs> so I'm trying, I'm not All tech, right. but I'm trying. <laughs> we had a panel at the evening and we talked about, I have a dream speech. Mm -hmm. Because the theme was remembering the dream. So what we did first is we showed the speech and then we had a lively discussion on where we are now, now and where do we need to be. So that was very profound. On Saturday, just absolutely beautiful. We watched Teal together. And then we had probably a maybe a two hour conversation following about the impact of Teal and the significance on it today. Um, and the impact on, on individuals of color and, and things that you have to do. And so that was just a powerful discussion. Sunday, we, had, we began with academic programs. And then on Monday, we had academic programs plus the luncheon. So, and we did it a little bit different this year. Usually during the luncheon, we'll have the speaker speak a few minutes and then he'll go or she will go to a different room and speak in front of students. This year, we decided to put it all in one, and it seemed to be more successful to have it all in one, and everybody could hear his message. And when he started to speak, we live streamed the speech so that people who weren't there could still see him speak, but not be at the right. So that's, that's great information. I will tell you, Dr. Fields, that as I've been involved in the MLK program over the years, I've, I've had the opportunity of presenting at the academic programs. I've also had the opportunity of... Uh, hosting the movie and, and to see the engagement mm -hmm. and just to see the eyeballs, if you will, those young people just light up. It, it's really a, it's really a blessing to see, to be honest with you. It is. It, the Teal was just so powerful. Yeah. And I think that just the story itself led to great conversations. And our movie audience was very diverse. We had children, uh, as young as probably seven or eight. And then we mm -hmm. had individuals, and I don't want to age anybody, as I must say close in the 70s. I'm not going any further than that. So we had, <laughs> we had a, a variety of mix and it was just, it was really wonderful to sit back and and just debrief about a movie that had such an impact on our lives. Yeah, and a point of personal information for me, the luncheon was phenomenal. Uh, the way uh, the doctors spoke, and he, he told stories and the way he pulled the audience into the stories, you, it, you can feel, it felt personal to him. And since it felt personal to him, it felt personal to the audience. I was scanning the room and it was a wonderful, diverse audience. And just to see people's emotions, uh, again, he was very impactful. Is that, do you know, is that on YouTube, his comment, his speech by chance? He, 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 we could not because of contract reasons. So we could not, but um, we would love to have him back. He was yeah. so inspirational. Just from that moment, I sat down with him. And then I told him, which he just smiled uh, ear to ear, that uh, Eastern bought 250 books. And I gave them out to students, staff, and faculty. And then awesome. after the luncheon, we had a sign, a, a book signing. 
So I brought more books in and just gave them away because I thought his message was so powerful. So he it was, was very joyful. <laughs> yeah, we have about two and a half minutes remaining. And I just want to segue, let's look forward. Here we are in Black History Month. I'm sure that the university plan, has plans currently be, taking place. What are what are some of the plans that are currently uh, up and running for Black History Month at Eastern Michigan University? Wow, we have tons. So I'll start with my area. Um, my area is CORE, which is the Center of Race and Equity. And the uh, program coordinator is Lachey Webb. She is doing phenomenal for Black History Month. We Last week, we had a uh, professional Black panel where they had professionals come in and talk about the job market. Where do you go? How do you put yourself in that position, your CVs and resumes? We are having a soul food tasting night at McKinney Ballroom on February 21st seven to nine. You have to sign up and you can sign up on an Instagram page so we can count how many people we have to feed. <laughs> so you have, to <laughs> yes, I like, you have to register. We also have trivia night, EMU alum versus students, February 20th, uh, Student Center Auditorium from seven to nine. We also have hip hop Zumba. I'm like, look at us. I know. <laughs> Look at us. So that will be in the Rec IM building, February 22nd from 5 to 7 and February 23rd from 3 to 5. And we also have a three-part civil rights social justice series on February 15th, hosted by uh, Barbara Patrick. Uh, and we are bringing in an alum uh, to talk about protests and uh, civil rights movement. So there are tons of things on campus. If you go to the EMU uh, calendar, you'll see tons of events for Black History Month. But we're very excited to support Black History Month. And then we follow up in March in my office with Women's History Month as well. So I'm saying, I mean, that's important. Make sure it's clearly understand Women's History Month is right around the corner. But I also like to say, as we wrap up, we shouldn't celebrate Black History Month and Women's History Month just one month out of the year. Excuse me, it should be 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, Dr. Doris Fields, I, I just want to thank you. You're doing phenomenal work and really engaging the community, you're engaging the students. And I want to, I want to thank you for all your, your commitment and everything that you're doing as well. Oh, thank you so much. It's my honor. I love EMU. So this, this is actually my honor to be able to serve others. It's a great honor. Thank Absolutely. you. My pleasure. And as we talk about serving others, as we talk about Eastern Michigan University, recently went to a ball game, first time in several years. And, and what we're going to do is after the break, talk to the coach from Eastern Michigan University, Coach Graydon. But in the meantime, I'm going to show you a video celebrating that recent victory for Eastern Michigan University. Hang tight. Eagle Nation, here we are in Boise, Idaho, with one more opportunity to leave your mark. Yes, bring it up, bring it up! One more opportunity to suit up with your brothers. I want every single person in here to have fun over these next three and a half hours, okay? One more opportunity to make history. And one more opportunity to stack. Pressure in the pocket, and he'll be sacked. Boy, the guy that caused the pressure there was Peyton Price. This one is blocked, and Eastern Michigan coming with it the other way. Get all the way into the end zone for Eastern Michigan. Evans takes the snap, runs it. There you go. Side is in the end zone. Touchdown. To Robinson. Robinson tripped up in the four yard line. He's not going to get in there. And he's to Michigan with a goal line stand. Looking, throws it out to his right side. Lassiter's got it at the 20, the 25, 30, cuts inside to the 35, still on his feet to the 40, the 45, still fighting his way out towards midfield. And he's finally brought down. Reception and Eastern Michigan goes ahead. Throws it over the middle, intercepts. 
intercepted by Eastern Michigan. They got it at the 30 and down at the 34-yard line. What a great job by Eastern Michigan. This is what we do. that uh, Coach Reed is on our hearts. And I promise you, he's smiling right now. All right, welcome back to EMU Today TV. Again, my name is Mark S. I'm your host. I hope you enjoyed that video of the recent victory for EMU's football team. Very proud moment for all of us as alums, as a university, as an institution. And I am so pleased to welcome the head coach from EMU's football team, Coach Chris Creighton. Coach, thanks for joining. How are you doing? Great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Congratulations on an outstanding season. And let's just kind of backtrack, if we could, uh, for a moment. Just kind of give us a brief overview of the season and how the team kind of coalesced and came together. At what point did you feel like they really started to come together uh, in preparation to certainly go to a bowl game? Yeah, you know, we were off to a, a pretty good start. Um, won at home, lost at Louisiana to a to a good team. Um, but then uh, went out to Arizona and beat Arizona State. Um, felt really good about that. Thought all three phases really played at a high level. When we came home, we lost to Buffalo, our first conference game. And so that was a real, um, a real downer, to be honest with you. Um, and we sort of went, you know, win, loss, win, loss for a couple of games there. Um, but found ourselves playing Toledo on October 29th uh, for the lead in the, the Mac West division. Lost that. Uh, with two minutes and 13 seconds left, uh, you know, on a fourth and 10 and really deflated, um, you know, our team because we were going to be out of the MAC championship at that point. Fortunately, it was a, a match in week. And so we had a couple extra days and, and the guys, we all really regrouped. And uh, that might be one of the things that I'm most proud of with this team is when we were out of the MAC championship, we made the decision that we were you know, not going to be out and that we're going to still play our best football towards the end. And that's when we went on that four game, you know, winning streak and won the bowl game and um, really made, you know, a really good season out of it. Let's talk about the bowl game. A lot of excitement, enthusiasm. Uh, I shared the story with you. Uh, I watched the game on TV. I started in the, in the Burbs, Western Burbs of Detroit, ended up in downtown Detroit with a bunch of a guy that actually had dinner with and a commitment with, and we all started watching the game. And when Eastern Michigan won that game, I, I think I sent you an email and referenced the fact that it was like we won the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. We have so many people in the room representing Eastern, but also of the universities from across the state of Michigan were there. And when Eastern won, the room just erupted. Of course, they all looked at me, <laughs> but um, I was very proud and alone, but there were other people that were just celebrating. Talk about that moment. Uh, at the football game when, when the clock is ticking down to zero? Well, you know, the story for that game is we were down 13 nothing, and yeah. did not did not get off to a great start. Um, but again, I do, I do think it's the resolve, the resiliency of our guys, the belief. Same thing when we lost that Toledo game. Um, we just didn't let that break us um, and then started playing our best football. Same thing in microcosm with the bowl game. We're down 13 nothing. Um, and then, you know, rattled off 28 straight points. Our defense really held a really good offense, and our offense got things together. And 
you know, we ended up, uh, you know, really playing well throughout the rest of that game um, to win. And um, we didn't, we sure didn't want to celebrate until the clock hit zero, but, you know, when it did, I mean, I think it was 131 years of football um, and to be the second team to win a bowl game in that time period, our guys, all of us knew, uh, you know, how, what a big deal it was. Um, yeah. And it's something that we, we'd been in four bowl games um, and really came down to the wire in three of those four, but lost them. Uh, so winning this one was a really big deal. There's a photo, me, there's a photo of you that went viral, uh, having the potato dumpling of French fries. How did, how did they taste? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I was trying to find Coach Nethery. We'd coached together, you know, we started coaching together 26 years ago and just really wanted to celebrate, you know, our last game together uh, with him on the sidelines, a ton of people. And I'm just getting to him and finds out that he'd already been doused with Gatorade and then was, I think, part of the plan to set me up to get it with the uh, the French fries. But it was a great moment. You could have thrown rocks on my head at that point, and I would have, uh, I still would have been happy. Well, let's segue to recruiting. And I know you have had a very strong recruiting class. The rankings came out recently. Talk about the expectations from a recruiting standpoint. How's the team looking moving forward? Yeah, I you know it's, you know, it's something that we had to figure out how to deal with um, in our recent past. And that was, you know, after victories, after success, how do we continue to stack more victories and have more success? And that was something that we struggled with. Um, was able to do that, obviously, in the in the second half of the season. So here we are in January and February trying to figure out now um, how do we stack a successful season. Um, and I, I do think that there's a lot that we've learned um, from this last year. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're ordering rings right now. You know, they they introduced us at halftime of the basketball um, game. There's, you know, t-shirts were given out after the bowl game. They sent hats because they ran out of them. And so you, you, you're continuing to celebrate what happened last season. And, you know, when it's only the second time in 131 years, you know, you want to be able to celebrate that at the same time, the coach in me is like, Hey, that's last year. You know, we can't be doing any of that. We've got to move we've got to move forward. So, um, you know, our team is, is in the process of, of starting over and getting ready for 2023. Um, the recruiting went well, uh, but I can tell you this. So four and five years ago, or maybe with COVID even six years ago, you know, we weren't ranked um, in the top of the Mid-America Conference recruiting. However, it was that recruiting six years ago, five years ago, and four years ago that produced the leadership of this year's team, right? So th that's the dot that people don't connect. Um, so now, um, you know, people who we don't know, nor do you or anybody else, um, are saying that we had a good recruiting class. You know, we, we believe it's a really good recruiting class, but not because other people who don't know us or our guys say that it is. Um, that's why I just take issue with it. You know, four years ago, if they said, okay, it's the second or third best recruiting class. Well, you know, we finished third in our conference this year. Um, but they didn't, they had us down towards the bottom. Um, and, uh, so I don't know how those things work. We'll find out about this recruiting class in four years when those guys are seniors and those guys are leaders in our program. Um, but we do feel really, really good about it. And, you know, in today's game you know it's not only high school freshmen and some junior college players but it's also the transfer portal and so there's three different wells from which to to drink if you will and um you know we go to all three wells and uh, really want to stay true to high school kids and we do that but when we need to fill fill people in we look to the junior colleges and into the transfer portal and, mm -hmm. uh, and i think too what what's they got Another great positive story, and Andrew Wiley, for example, uh, going to the Super Bowl, a former student of mine at EMU and a former player for you. And, and I think that, you know, through uh, just osmosis and the halo effect, e EMU will get more additional publicity 
sending him back and some other players that we've had in the NFL and certainly doing well professionally, that's got to be a residual benefit for you, even as you go into recruiting trail, I would think. Oh, yeah, no question. I mean, shoot, we'll be, I don't know, what is it? Uh, we'll have played in three of the last five uh, Super Bowls. Um, yeah. Pretty awesome. So really, really proud of Wiley and, and all these accomplishments. He started for them since 2018. My daughter and I went to the Super Bowl against the 49ers and in Miami to watch them. And, and when they won that, it was a huge thrill. Yeah. Um, this last weekend, you know, we were in Las Vegas watching Jose Ramirez crush it in the East West Shrine game. And then Max Crosby again was part of uh, the Pro Bowl festivities. Um, and then City So was in the NFL PA All Star game a week before. Chad Ryland, an Eastern grad. Um, yeah was in the senior bowl. And um, I think Greg, is that the three are so yeah. So we'll have three Eastern Michigan graduates in this year's combine, NFL combine. And from what I understand from Greg, that is the first time a Mid-America team ever has had three in in one combine. So um, you know, we were rated the best culture. We uh, had the most academic all Mac selections. There's a lot of positivity going on uh, with the football program right now. And um, that, you know, we've got to translate that into playing great football in the fall. Uh, but, you know, right now we're super proud of our guys and, and what they're doing on and off the field. We have about two minutes remaining, and I want to segue into the academic part of this. I mean, they are, quite frankly, student athletes. And how are you getting these student athletes prepared to come to college? You're recruiting them. And, and getting them prepared to do well academically as well. I know that Eastern's done very well in terms of academics, uh, ac academics overall in the American Conference. What are your keys to success in ensuring that they're successful uh, off the field as well? Yeah, well, first of all, we just, we recruit, you know, great people. No, Nobody's perfect, obviously, but, you know, we recruit people. We say we, in recruiting, we don't recruit idiots or fools. You don't have a you know an opportunity for a first class education like we have here at Eastern Michigan and not take advantage of it. And so if it's you know we try to weed that out in the recruiting process. So uh, you know when our guys get here, they know that you know going to class and doing well academically is is part of it. Um, we've had a 3.0 team cumulative GPA for five straight years now. Yes, and then this is the second year in a row when we've had the most academic all max selections. And I don't take, you know, any responsibility in that. I just take, I'm just so proud of our guys for uh, doing it the right way and doing it well. We had 17 guys graduate at the midterm, or excuse me, in December in Boise, Idaho, and 19 guys working on their master's degrees this season. Mm -hmm. It's just awesome. Now, COVID obviously helps that out. But again, we just don't recruit fools or, or idiots. And, and so these guys are really... Um, there's 24 hours in the day. You got to sleep for eight. It's 16 hours, you know, to, to eat um, and, you know, to take care of what you got to take care of academically and to pursue, you know, their passion of football. And there's, there's plenty of time for that. Yeah. Um, they do get awesome support from people like yourself and the faculty here and with our student athlete success services. Um, uh, the guys are supportive. They're or supported. They're met where they need to be met. Um, but I think it really starts with them, you know, intrinsically being motivated to to earn a degree and, you know, to really make something out of themselves whenever football is over. Um, so it, it's really worked out well and, and we're proud of them. Well, as we wrap up, let me just say it's an honor for me to be involved in that recruiting process and providing academic experience. And I have several of the student athletes uh, who take my classes. They do phenomenal. So congratulations on a job well done. Congratulations to EMU's football team. We wish you, wish you much continued success. Appreciate it. You've, you've been a big supporter and a big help in recruiting and, and even while they're here. And um, appreciate it a lot. My pleasure. And that's it for this edition of EMU Today TV. We will check you out next time. Go out, make it a great day, make it a great week, make it a great month, and we'll see you soon.